Thank you very much, Linda. Um, and yeah, just to just to echo what what you've said about how the I would like to to run this meeting. Um, obviously, the, you know, with three different uh, ways of asking to speak, it, it might you know I might accidentally miss you, but it isn't personal, and I will sort of bring you in as uh, as soon as I spot you. Okay. Um, and as Linda said as well, if you can keep yourself on mute, that'll be fantastic. Um, obviously, you know, people do have uh, other people in their houses or other animals, and sometimes it's quite interesting to hear them, but it's uh, not always such, so, so great for everybody else. And if you're having any problems with your, um, with, so either, you know, with hearing or, or anything, then feel free to turn your video off if that, if that helps, okay? And again, won't be offended if you if you choose to do that so going back to um this discussion and so we're, we're looking at recovery but how do you get back to a version of normality whilst we're still in a pandemic you know that's that's the big question um and what i was going to do before we actually talk about the you know actually look at the questions that i think you've already may have seen i was actually going to bring bruce in at this moment because he's our director of public health and i think he might be able to give you a bit of a flavor about where where we've been in terms of you know what has been the the, the new norm <coughs> and and where where we might be going with this over to you bruce okay thank you dina um first uh, just second linda's comments about how many people have been really important in supporting us through this outbreak and, and a lot of the credit's gone to the health service but by, by no means the only people that have put themselves out. Um, so in, in, the, in Bath North East Somerset um, and in the South West generally you will know we've had a relatively good experience. We've consistently had about half the number of cases and half the number of deaths in the region that the whole country has had on average. Um, Bath North East Somerset is now the fifth lowest um, in terms of the rate of cases out of over 150 local authorities. So, so far good, but by no means unscathed. We've had 90 deaths um, and over half of those have been in care homes. And you all know that care homes have taken a brunt of illness and death that, you know, was very unfortunate. And we've had um, a confirmed about 300 and um, 80 cases, or 40, 340 cases, but that's a tip of an iceberg. We probably had a few thousand, which means that um, we've done well in that respect. But it also means that you know the vast majority of the population, 95, 98, 99 percent, are, are not immune, even if having the illness gives you immunity. So we are where we are now. We have very few cases. We we probably have just a handful of people in the whole of Baines with actively with the virus you know maybe it's 20 30 50 at most um, but the virus is with us in the country and in the world and it, it won't go it won't be eradicated um, probably not even if we get a vaccine if we get a vaccine that that's good that will make a huge difference but we do have this now so um, whether there's something called a second wave or a resurgent first wave or, or what we are with it and we have to learn to live with it um, but what we can do if we are careful hopefully is resume a more normal um, lifestyle um, but still control the number of cases the number of illnesses and the number of deaths um, and how do we do that well that, that's that's a that's the big question because we don't really know how the virus will behave in the winter we don't know how it will to relate with flu um, we don't even know whether we'll get some really good treatments we're, we're learning all the time um, so I think that the, the task of, of you and us I think I mean for me I say there are two pillars of um, it, controlling this outbreak the, the one pillar is having the capacity in our testing tracing isolating system to get on top of cases to get on top of outbreaks quickly and by isolate by identifying contacts and isolating we suppress we prevent them becoming big and i'm hopeful we can do that the the other very big pillar to me which is where you come in everyone comes in but local leaders really strongly is how do we keep the population on side living a more normal lifestyle going you know seeing your family going to your pubs restaurants events um 
workplaces, shops, etc. Um, but in a more careful way than we would have done in the past. So we still are mindful of not transmitting because we know that um, in the early periods of the illness, people can transmit before they've had any symptoms, before they even know they have it. Um, so that's really the task, and that's the task of communication. It's a task of community leadership. And I suppose the third, third task, I mean, mindful that Claire is here to talk more about that, is, is how we support people in need who are in need for some COVID related reason or indeed any other reason, which is of course another local community task, just that good neighbourliness, that, that organised helping out. Um, so I think I, I, I don't want to drone on for ages. That's probably all I would say for now. My, you know, my plea is work with us, um, be local leaders, uh, keep people try, trying to be careful, but also recognise that this is a long term thing. Now we, we need to go back to we need to go back to our schools, universities. We need to move on with lives, um, and there will be there will be cases. I'm I'm still hopeful that we can see a continuing fairly good experience in Baines, but you know nothing is guaranteed. We don't know how the virus will work even through a one year cycle yet. So you know we have to keep on ourselves. Um, I think stay alert. They say, but I say you know stay mindful, stay careful, um, and that's that's my. Pitch, D. Dina, is there anything else you, you think I should be saying or covering? Uh, no, I don't think so at this moment. I mean, obviously there will be questions, I'm sure, or, or comments that uh, will come from from um, those on, on this uh, call, which I'm sure, you know, we will be able to, to pick up um, as, as we go along. Um, so, yeah, as I said, want to keep this as a, as a discussion we've got about six questions to kind of give us some focus for our discussions if there are points that you want to raise through the chat uh, if you are used to using that then please feel free to add comments on there I will try and keep an eye on the chat on the hands being raised up uh, virtually and also uh, physically as well um, and I might, I might ask you to repeat perhaps a, a point that you might have made uh, on the chat um, as well. So we'll just sort of play it a bit by ear because I know that not everybody is as, um, has the same level of experience on, on, on Zoom. Um, and we'll, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll have a good discussion and hopefully we'll get some, you know, good, um, and we'll get some good learning from this as well. All right. Okay, so the first question, and this picks up, I think, on some of the points that Bruce was making, is around a community support, a reflection on the community support. So for you, what did you think worked well and what didn't? So I don't know who, who wants to make a start on that. Um, you know, because I'm very happy to open up with a, a comment, perhaps, on a partnership that I think worked particularly well and that was between the third sector groups with 3SG, with Virgin, and also with the council. Um, and that ability to set themselves up and form, you know, a, a really cohesive um, and, you know, with varying levels of support as, as necessary for a wide variety of different um, situations, I think was, was fantastic. But I know that within each of your own communities you too have done similar pieces of work so it'd be really helpful to hear what you've done in your areas and what you thought worked well and again you know what what you've learned from that and you know there might be things that you'd like to um continue with as well um okay so michael you managed to put your hand up when i was talking so i didn't spot you but now i'll bring you in um so michael evans um, oh, sorry, yes, it's going back a little bit to uh, Bruce. Um, but to answer the, your question that you just made, though, at the very beginning, um, I had quite a few phone calls from quite um, upset people who, who uh, wondered how they were going to get food and so on. And then once the community hub was set up, absolutely nothing. Haven't had any distressed phone calls for quite a few weeks now. So obviously, I would say worked very well. I wanted to ask Bruce, is he the person who's going to be responsible for calling a local lockdown? If we get to that situation. Do you want me to answer that, Dina? Off you I, go, Bruce. I, 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 do you know, in reality, Michael, and nice to speak to you, Michael. Um, in reality, it's going to be a discussion, isn't it, between 
the public health authorities, the political leaders, me, Will, you know, I, I'm not going to just go into a quiet room and declare Summer Valley closed to, uh, it, it's getting, and, and I think what we'll see actually, Michael, is that it's going to, we'll see a few places trying things out and you'll see it will be probably quite difficult and quite painful because obviously there's a lot riding on local lockdowns. My point I will make continuously is we just don't really want to go there. We, we want to be ahead of it. We want to be doing the best we can. Um, if we're doing the best we can, then there's, there's, there's little to be gained. It's a last resort. Um, the powers, no, no doubt, I mean, having looked at them briefly, no doubt they're quite hard to use, you know, because it's not something one should just be able to, you know, do, do it uh, on a whim. So, it, yeah, we'll all be in that uh, discussion and I'll be the public health advisor to that, clearly. And, um, but that, you know, there's a lot to consider, isn't there, in doing something like that beyond, beyond pure epidemiology. Thanks. Thanks. And yes, there's a lot of criteria that need to be um, fulfilled before you can declare any sort of or even put in motion the, the process of a, a local lockdown. So as Bruce says, it's not going to be something that would just happen, you know, overnight. I, I, I can't imagine that that would be the case anyway. And as uh, Bruce alluded to, there's, um, you know, some new powers that we've been given as a council as well. But how those um, are, of how those operate in reality again is is something that we really need to sort of work through and and it may be that we won't know for sure how it all works until you no. know if, if until we're actually faced with that situation if, if it was very small like one one factory or school then that that that's a smallish you know fairly quick decision i think anything when you talk about a local lockdown you, you probably mean a, a bit more of an area i think that that's a bigger that's obviously a bigger decision Absolutely, yes. No, uh, thank you very much for that question, uh, Michael. Sally? Two things. I think the chat's disabled um, at the moment, do you know, in case people are trying to use it. I just say that, but that wasn't really what I was going to say, but oh. when I tried to get in, it says disabled. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, I was just to say, it did work well, and I found I got two villages, I, well, I've written more than two villages, but two larger villages, and they worked in completely different ways, which makes it more difficult for, for the council or whoever it is to decide exactly um, how it's, what's the best strategy. Because one of my villages worked very much as a whole community and supported themselves completely as a whole community, whereas the other broke up into smaller sections. In fact, they're slightly smaller of the two villages, but they broke up into smaller sections and smaller communities within there helped each other. So it's, it doesn't make it easy because there's obviously not one solution for everybody. Um, and again, I'm in villages not actually in a town where it may be different again but it was very notable for me that two villages had actually two very different ways of working both supported their residents um, there's no doubt about that um, but as I say in two very different ways mm. and I think that's a really good point because that just shows that there's no one sort of right way of doing things and I, and I guess you know the learning that we've had from that is you can't kind of superimpose something on on groups of of people on, on communities um so yeah i think that that is definitely something that uh, we'll be reflecting on um so i'm just trying to quickly whiz through the let's see if anybody's got their their hand up um i don't know if me ah elizabeth, elizabeth. You have, you're, you're waving at me because you're very pleased to see me or you actually want to speak <laughs> I was indeed. Uh, I just wanted to mention that Big Local uh, was quite effective in Radstock and uh, they delivered uh, hot meals to 750 households over the time uh, and people of all ages and, and as well as uh, deliveries for people, you know, getting them medication and that sort of thing. And uh, They've, they've done a very good job so far. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think, you know, again, another fantastic organisation that, that has come into its own at this time. Um, I just wondered, and, and maybe Elizabeth, you might be a good person to ask on this. Has there been any sort of difficulty in stepping, stepping this operation down at all? At the moment, the hot uh, meals have uh, been suspended. I don't know if Elizabeth heard my question there. 
You've been suspended. Uh, it's well. Uh... Oh, sorry, Elizabeth, you've been muted. There we are. Okay. Uh, at the moment, it you know that has come over, but the other uh, areas that they've been working on, you know, helping uh, young people with babies and that sort of thing. Uh, that continues on. Okay, that's that's great to to hear. Um, have I got any more comments? I was actually going to ask Dave perhaps if he wants to give a, a view from, you know, from the inner sanctum, as it were, of the Compassionate um, Communities Hub. Yeah, I. I, I was, I must admit, I was very um, heartened to hear the comments from um, Councillor Evans about the fact that obviously when they have... I'm opened... not sure, have, has it, is it me? Have I gone a bit peculiar? Oh, oh. yeah, yeah you okay. gone, Dina. It's gone. It's okay, That's I hope you can back. Am I back? Yeah, you can hear, right? Um, no, it's very hard. Heartened to hear the comments from um, Councillor Michael Evans about, about when the hub opened and obviously the number of um, uh, calls uh, calls reduced. Um, but, I, but also, to be fair, I think to some of the local villages and the parish and town councils, they've been really very instrumental in helping us deliver one of our key aims, which was to try and deliver services locally at a grassroots level as much as we possibly could. So we knew months ago that we'd had thousands of people that were shielding and they were going to be shielding for months. And we knew that that was going to create all sorts of problems and issues for us. Uh, and as a council, we were never going to have the resources to be able to deliver that single handedly. So the hub has been a really good example of collaboration between ourselves, the three SG community and voluntary sector and Virgin Care. But of course, some of the partners that have been instrumental also have, like I said, have been the parish and town council. So they've not necessarily been in the hub, but we've been able to uh, we've been able to rely on them to deliver a lot of the grassroots stuff, like medication supplies and befriending services and so forth. So there's been a real um, there's been it's been a real four month eye opener about how to work collaboratively and to be actually be driven by demand in a sense a huge demand was there and by necessity we had to find a way of delivering it and 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 parishes and town councils midsummer norton in particular i know that there was a, an operation that was um, run from the town hall in midsummer norton and i also know that obviously radstock town council and the radstock big local also did an awful lot of work which if if they hadn't picked up those th that demand um it would have come back to us as a council um and we would we would struggle with the numbers. So I think we had about two and a half thousand people shielding who were getting food, weekly food parcels. Um, now that was being done obviously by the wholesalers, but on top of that we had blood samples to do, me, uh, medication drops to do, emergency food parcels to do to uh, people that were in um, real severe difficulty. Uh, and we've done about three or four hundred of those, and probably about 50 of them have been in the Summer Valley area. So actually the majority of them were in Bath. So certainly the Cainsham area, Cainsham and Chu Valley and Summer Valley have, have, have been really instrumental in, in self-help, which is something that we want to learn from and actually build on. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm gonna bring Linda in now. Yes, just very briefly, we've had two more people join the meeting, so I'd just like them to introduce themselves. We have Miriam. Can you unmute? And yeah, hello, hi. Yeah, so Miriam Warmer, um, Summer Valley Rediscovered Project. Okay, and Alistair. You're muted, Alistair. Can you unmute? How's oh, that? That's, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Hello, everybody. You'll have to excuse me. Um, as you can see, I'm I'm still um, recovering from a stroke I had in February. So 
if my attention drops, I do apologise. Okay, well, it's nice to see you anyway. And lovely okay. to see everybody as well, yeah. Lovely to see you all. And back to you, Dina. Thank you very much um, for spotting the, the new new arrivals, Linda. Um, so that disconcerting moment where you go all off to me again. So what I was also going to ask, and you might not be able to answer this right away, but what are your thoughts about if there is a second wave and what do we do then? Do you think your support networks, the, the community, would step up again? So I don't know how well you, if you heard that, that question. It was just about what happens in the future if you thought your community support networks would be um, as willing and as able to, to step up um, to meet a new challenge. Josie, I hope you're indicating that's because you heard my question. Can you unmute yourself, Josie? Sorry, there. Um, we, we got together with um, the local pharmacy and the churches together and the church is led really and built up a community of um, contacts where somebody had a number to ring and that person then passed them on to you know they sort of divvied it up between people and I feel very confident that that would continue if we had to go through it all again. Hmm. Thank you because I, I you know and I suspect this is a question that um, I guess Sarah and Dave will be asking um, you know about how how robust was the system you know and is it going to be there in the future if, it, if it's needed or, or you know and it may be that um, a future need might need a different type of support as well so it's be useful just to kind of bear that in mind because as Bruce and others have said you know we're, we're not out of the woods yet the pandemic is still here so we need to be kind of ready for all sorts of eventualities Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to the second question, which is, and I'll read the question for you, which is, what can we do to keep behaviours good and levels low in our current position? So, um, Bruce, can you just, from, I don't know if you've got any data on, on uh, you know, how low the levels were um, in the Chew Valley area, but obviously, you know, it has been low across both <laughs> the North East Somerset. I think the numbers of cases from, I mean, I haven't done a big study because we didn't have very many, but as far as I can see, the numbers of cases were roughly in proportion to population. So there really would have been, you know, more in Bath than elsewhere, and then uh, Radstock, Midsummer, Norton, Canesham, and then in the rural areas, um, very few. I think part of the reason the South West did well, I think probably maybe the biggest one of the biggest reasons certainly is is the dispersed population really where your people are packed together they're they're, they're going to be more uh, transmission although some rural areas like cumbria didn't do so well at all so that's not an absolute um mm. yeah and, and when we're talking about keeping behaviors good i assume you know we everybody will understand obviously about washing your hands and maintaining social distance and wearing a mask as um as appropriate. I mean, are there other things that people should be thinking about as well? I mean, a lot, a lot of it's, yeah, mostly it's commonsensical, really. Um, do those things that Dean has said. Some of the things I say are so obvious, I, I wonder whether it's worth saying them, but if you see a crowded place in a quiet place, go to the quiet bar or the quiet restaurant or pub. Outside is easier than inside, which is part of the reason that some of the restrictions you know we're loosening them in summer to get people used to that because when we all move indoors if you're talking to people you know and you can't be as far away as you like but be side to side rather than face to face don't go somewhere where you have to uh, shout to be heard because um, the louder you speak the more you you put um, you put droplets out and the same you know singing is something that unfortunately um, we all like to do but it, it does uh, droplets more than uh, talking quietly 
So I, th I think th those are the, the main things. And if you do all those things and everyone around you does, you know, hopefully one doesn't need to be too uh, paranoid because, you know, the numbers of cases are, are fairly low still. When they become more common, you know, one part of our job is to make people aware when things are starting, you know, when you're getting more cases and particularly if a certain area you know one town or one village seems to have a cluster where we'll try and work out what's going on there but we will also tell people you know just be aware that your area has a little bit more um be more careful be even you know more careful about abiding by the rules so it's not rocket science if you imagine it's spread by surfaces and by you know proximity to people you you can sort of make your own um you can kind of think think things through yourself can't you Mm. Well, thank you, Bruce. So I, I know Linda wanted to speak and then, uh, so Linda and then Michael. <coughs> Linda. Yes, yeah, so I just, well, I hate to say this about Ned Summon Orphan, but um, sort of basically talking about keeping behaviours good. Um, we've had two or three crowds of youngsters coming in and fighting on, on the high street. And I don't think that's doing any good for them any more than it is for the people who are going down to the high street to go to the pub or the takeaway or whatever. And so is that something that we need to um, have a look at as well? Yeah, I would say so. I, I, I see that Bruce looked like he was about to unmute himself to come in there. But, you know, and I think one of the, the, the factors, um, you know, and it has been mentioned, you know, on the news and in other places too, that young people particularly, I think have been very badly, not hit in terms of getting the virus themselves, but actually about its impact on their mental well-being uh, and on their kind of way of life because many young people have been used to uh, perhaps a greater amount of freedom and so lockdown has impacted very harshly on, on young people uh, and we've seen this in some you know, unfortunate behaviour uh, you know, it, as you say, in Midsummer Norton, on the beaches of, you know, uh, Bournemouth, etc., and in other places as well. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's more more that needs to be done for for young people um, in in uh, certain areas, uh, as well as obviously, you know, making sure we've got some more support to to help young people, uh, particularly around their mental health. Um, Bruce, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Well, I second your point that it has been hard on young people and I'm, I'm very conscious that we need to, um, and when people need to get back to school, get back to study. Um, and what I, it would be really sad if, if we got into a situation, which I can definitely see where everyone's sort of, you know, got a down on everyone else, the young people because they can't do anything and the older people because the young people are playing up and this group and that group, we, we want to try and avoid that. But yes, of course, it's not helpful. And I don't know how, apart from giving young people, you know, more things to do, I don't know how you completely stop that. I recognise that, you know, that they're not just going to go away because someone in the town tells them to do that. So uh, it, it's a challenge. I know we've had success with, uh, with some of the alcohol problems of Midsummer Norton in the past. So I know we have had that community focus with Police and with licensees and the council and we've made some inroads so uh, I, I agree it's a difficult issue but I, I certainly wouldn't like to have a down on young folk who see their future really uh, you know it, it's, it's a tough time for them now and it, and it looks like it could be tough later on so uh, we've got to be mindful of that too. Mm, thank you Bruce and actually this is a really uh, probably a very pertinent moment to bring you in Michael Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, I, as far as Mr. Norton's concerned, we the town council did decide to keep on the the uh, the marshals at the weekend, which I think has helped. They've been quite active on some weekends and have uh, probably saved what might have been uh, wor worse incidents. Um, it will be good to hear from the police. Uh, um, I guess uh, I don't know whether. Sarah tried to get the police, but uh, this is one of the few forums where we managed to contact the police, really. So if, if one can get them, it will be good to have them. Um, of course, Charmy Dan can be added to that list of problem areas, which you were <laughs> making earlier. Uh, quite I know all about that. Yes. <laughs> mm. 
that's all yeah thanks so so that was all you were going to say yeah hoping for the police is basically what i'm saying <laughs> Okay, um, sorry, was there a member of the police on the call? I, I can't see. Sorry, that, so I've just got a note that the police are unable to attend this meeting. Um, but as you can imagine, I am in contact with the police, particularly around Charmy Down. So I will, uh, you know, add it onto their list of, um, you know, things to do to, to come to Midsummer Norton and to, and to help. Okay, uh, so I'm moving to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I hope you haven't had your hand up all this time. <laughs> You're muted again. Elizabeth, you need to unmute yourself. Mark, can you help um, Elizabeth unmute, please? Oh, you're unmuted now. Don't. Oh, no, you're back. <laughs> it's like mute wha whack-a-mole, isn't it? Um, so, Elizabeth, don't touch anything. Mark's going to sort it out. Right, All Elizabeth, right. speak. Don't touch anything. Okay. Elizabeth, speak. Yes. Uh, I would like to cite Sam Plummer and Youth Connect. They've been brilliant at dispersing, uh, in a gentle way, uh, the crowds of, of young people that have tended to gather in the center of uh, Radstock. And they did it beautifully without, you know, threats or other things like that. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think that's a really, really lovely thing to, to hear. Um, right. Uh, is there any more questions or, or comments on, on this? Um, as, as Bruce says, I think a lot of this is going to be down to, to common sense. It's also got to be down to recognising that none of us can be complacent. And that's going to be the real challenge, I think. So the longer, you know, a pandemic or this type of situation goes on, the more people think well why should i bother it's not it's not affecting me and i think that's where you know when you start to drop your guard you know things could easily easily change uh right so i'm going to move to the third question actually and i just pick up on the point that i uh and um linda mentioned before which is about mental health issues and how can we no, what can we do to ensure people with mental health issues have the right support? Um, I wonder if uh, maybe Claire might want to come in uh, on this one. Thank you, Dina. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really lovely to speak to you all. Um, as we've mentioned, throughout the Compassionate Community Hub, we've had a range of partners um, engaged in what we've set up is what we call POPs. And one of those POPs has been about the um, sort of well-being of individuals both emotionally and and physically so we've had a you know virgin cares um physical team supporting people to stay active as well but of course we know don't we the um, not just the physical side but it's that emotional side um supporting people through their various levels of mental health and what we found throughout the um the covid crisis is we've had some very complex cases Yes, um, and we're very fortunate to have Bath Mind working out of the CCH. So we've had those dedicated mental health practitioners on site and available to provide at times that crisis support and that urgent support that people need. But outside of that is also making sure that people have support that they, if they bring in with a low, um, what you might refer to professionally as, as a low, lower level of anxiety, they still actually have had access to a professional or signpost of where to go to get the ongoing support. And what we're talking about in terms of continuation of the CCH is how we continue to support those one complex cases and two as well um, as we're moving out of um, COVID and easements, the anxiety that people have might change. So at one point we have people calling with a level of anxiety being in relation to being in isolation and where do they go for help and support? How do they go about making sure their basic needs are met? 
to some calls now um, about supporting people through levels of anxiety and mental health, about actually how do they reintegrate and go back out and have access to um, things that Bruce said again, appropriately going back out um, into society and undertaking the roles that they do. So the point being, I know Dave and Sarah, you might want to come in as well, is that Bath Minds are a an active partner. We have trained professionals on hand. The CCH is still open and available. And if there's anything that we can do to support you and your local community, whether it be through better signposting, information, um, et cetera, et cetera, please do let Sarah or Dave know. And we can, of course, pick that up as one of the actions. Because again, it's getting that balance right of having a central place to come, isn't it, with Virgin Care and partners as our health and adult social care provider, alongside equipping all of our um, community to have access to the right information and make sure we're all giving that consistent messaging, isn't it, and signposting people very effectively right from grassroots level through to professional services. So I hope that's in some way given some reassurance about um, you know, the level of support that we have. But of course, if you have some very individual questions or needs that are in relation to your, lo your locality and your community, please do route them through to us and we will, we will endeavour to make sure that we can take it up as an action or provide you with the adequate signposting that you feel you need to take it forward. Is that okay, Dina? Is there anything else no, you'd that, like to comment on? That, that, that's great. In fact, um, I see that there's a note in the chat uh, about um, uh, how, sorry, the, the Bath Mind delivers a project called Breathing Spaces, and there's a number on the screen which I'm sure we can circulate to everybody on this on this call uh, after after this uh, session. I, I don't know, if Dave um, or Sarah, if you wanted to. So it's very disconcerting when you get yourself into a, an echo. Um, if you wanted to speak while I try and sort no, my Gina, I just like, Yeah, can I just, I just echo um, obviously what, um, what Claire said. One of, the, one, of the, one of the roles of the forums and the individual people in the forums, in a sense, is to be that conduit, that communications network. So if in your daily life and your work and your volunteering stuff that you come across people where you think there is a need perhaps to refer them to more professional help and support. And because now we've got the, uh, the compassion communities have with all the partners, that is the place to send some of that stuff. So again, you may well be seeing some of these people and some of these people may be presenting themselves in the weeks to come as you know, because things have been very difficult over the last four months. But what we are trying to do is try and say, uh, it's, it's this no wrong door um, um, message. So it doesn't matter how some of these individuals come to our attention, we need to make sure that we can give them the best possible wraparound care, especially for some of the complex ones. So if you do come across people that you think could benefit from any kind of additional support, then if you can't either refer them yourselves to the, to the hub or actually see if you can get them to refer themselves in, and then we can try and identify, because often now the ones that we're dealing with now are, are, are complex needs people with often there are two or three issues that some of our professional partners in the organization can deal with. So that's what we would be asking from the forums. And we're hoping in the future to roll out a, a bit of a training program with the 3SG uh, around what's called Compassionate Community Connectors. And so all of the people that are on the forums would be ideally placed for that training to be able to identify some of those needs, but more importantly, to know where to send that referral on to. So we're rather hoping to roll that out for the rest of the year um, uh, and, 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 and ongoing, because if there, is a, um, if there is a second wave, then it will be really important that we, we've got those communication links, but it's important that we've got them anyway, even if, uh, even if we've seen the last of it, which uh, I don't think we have, but it's just that, it's that communications network that we need to build on. Mm. And, and as you said, uh, you know, I think it will be really helpful to share all of these training opportunities um, because, you know, you, you don't know, it, you know, it might actually be something that really appeals to somebody else maybe in the community who might otherwise um, perhaps be perhaps at more of a loose end and then may find themselves in, in some, some difficulties. I mean, they, they often say, don't they, that uh, 
that the, the groups that are most uh, affected are often the ones that um, are, are best able to help others. So, um, yes, if you are interested in any of the, that, that training, then obviously uh, let us know and we can make sure that you um, have access to that. So, uh, so my next question, okay, keeping you all on track here, is uh, around what do we do if cases start to creep up on a, a general Baines-wide or nationwide basis? Uh, I think this might be an ideal opportunity, Bruce, to perhaps um, go through the local outbreak management plan um and you know and obviously i'll then fill in with that yeah. engagement piece as well okay so so we've we've all been asked to make local outbreak management plans by each local authority and there are sort of common themes that we have to look at and some of them are what do we do if there's an outbreak in um very obvious places where we might expect them you know the or the common places school uh, care homes for example then we also asked to know where all our vulnerable communities are vulnerable um, for any reason uh, illness or uh, homelessness or um, any, any any way we define it really um, then we're asked to um, have um, a good local coordination of the tracking and tracing system there's a lot of national parts to that system but locally we have some control over it and some coordination and then I think the bit that's really important for this discussion for me is uh, or two bits. One is uh, the support to people who are isolating, as we've already discussed. But the other one is a communications and engagement strategy, because through good communications and engagement with, with public and local leadership, that, that's hopefully how we can respond in that preventive way. So if we know that cases are creeping up nationally or if we know they're creeping up uh, in a local area, or amongst a, a certain section of our population, um, we are setting up channels of this, which this is one, and communication messages um, based on, on local and national messages to, to, to basically ex explain to people the, the, the situation as it's developing and what they need to do to protect themselves and protect others around them. So that's the sort of essence of the local plan. And we have we've set up two boards. The the governance bit one is a COVID health protection board, which is the bit that works on the tracking and tracing and outbreak control. And then there's a board called the stakeholder engagement board that is is chaired by the council leader. And and that's really the outward facing for me. That's the main outward facing board which communicates, um, provides leadership and communication with um, the the people of um, Baines. So um that's that's really I, I i see us having a sort of a traffic light to me i think when when things are green as they are now it's how can we get keep people um behaving you know in, in in good protective ways and then when it gets a bit yellow and cases are on the rise how do we say you know you've got you've got to take notice you've got to really be careful now about what you do more than before and then i when it's red when there's a real outbreak somewhere of course then we have to be able to really uh, blitz that area with information and get people really mobilized and also do our you know maximum tracing and um and tracking operation so that's i think what the, the outbreak plan's about and your local role in it and, and kind of covers a bit what happens if cases are going up um, and of course all that coordinates with national messaging which i know people think hasn't been perfect but there's a lot of information out now so that you know everyone individuals can check how cases are in their in their areas up to a point anyway thank you bruce and uh, and you know it is really important for you to know that you are going to be so critical in in terms of disseminating any information out to your communities if if we actually have to uh, you know, if there is any sort of um, rise in numbers, rising cases in, in your area or in the communities that you are involved in. Um, so Bruce uh, spoke a little bit about a stakeholders engagement board. So throughout the, should we call it sort of the, the, the hot end of the um, pandemic, you know, so I was meeting with um, stakeholders uh, from a range of uh, areas so from the police to the fire to the ccg to um 
uh, to Kuro, you know, everybody that had a, a state, oh, the universities obviously as well, everybody that had, um, could be considered to, to have a, a, a stake in, in this. Um, and so this board has really just been expanded to fulfill a function that's been set by, by government around um, engagement. And as I said, you know, I, I hope that, it, well, I hope we never have to do this, but I hope if we do have to, um, you know, work together on addressing a local outbreak, that I can convene a meeting like this and talk directly to you uh, and ask you to, to play your part in, in um, trying to, to, to get that um, situation stabilised as quickly as possible. So I'm thanking you in advance as well for your, your help on that. Uh, so I'm just having a look to see if anybody's got their hand up. So Josie has. Uh, so Josie, if you can unmute and I'll just skim through and see if there's anyone else who would like to speak. So Josie, over to you. Um, there's been an awful lot of talk about um, the, the very good work that the Community Hub has done. Um, can you see this being a long term project like forever? type of thing you know just carrying on and on or but is it an emergency view, only but my personal view is i think it has proved um phenomenally successful i think there is a definitely a future for it in should we call peacetime um mm. and but it, a lot will depend on the willingness of the various partners to continue that that working together um and also i think a bit about how how we can, I feel like this is the wrong forum to say this, but sort of to get around some of the rules and, and procedures that we often put in place mm. uh, for, which then stop such organizations as this um, working as well as they can. Uh, I, I guess this would be a good moment to ask Claire for her opinion as well. Thank you, Dina. Um, just, just to give some reassurance that um, Jo Scammell, who's the senior leader in Virgin Care, that's been um, prominent in the establishment of the CCH along with the partners, um, and I, we have been constructing a business case that will go through, through both the council and the CCG. Um, for people to, to, to comment on um, how we secure um, as Dina said, the, the winning list, I, I do believe, is very much secured, isn't it? But how we secure the, the appropriate governance and um, um, funding, isn't it? And look at how we fund this appropriately with the confines of the, of the um, you know, how we do things and what's appropriate to do. So there's an absolute willingness from all parties, an absolute willingness from the, from the funded parties as well as 3SG. Um, so please rest assured that we are working through that as a matter of urgency. Um, so um, well, by the time we come around to the next set of forum meetings, I will be able to give you a much more concrete view on how we can do that. But in the first instance, Joe and I have put together a business case that takes the CCH to a continuation to the end of this um, financial year, and then a proposal for how we can fund it into the next contractual year as well. But at the moment, that's just proposal. It needs to go through the full council and CCH. The, um, governance process to have a formal decision raised on that but I'm very heartened to hear people's willingness to support and I just want to publicly thank Dina as well because I know you've been a great support in this and it, it really is very much appreciated. Thank you Claire. So I'm looking to see if I've got any speakers. Um, I'm just double checking into the chat. you have to have a bit of a system don't you to make sure you've uh, you've covered all the all the bases to, to make sure you've not missed anybody out is anybody feeling missed out at the moment <laughs> that's good right okay um so so i guess you know the the chief thing to learn there is you'll be part of that response um if uh, if uh, cases uh, do creep up so the, the next question, and I think there's going to be quite a lot of interest in this, is about the support uh, that we can give to local businesses, because I think a lot of businesses, local businesses particularly, have gone, you know, above and beyond to, to help support their local um, customer base um, and, and really have, have helped those that 
you know, may otherwise have not been able to access food or, or other services. So how can we support our local businesses to get up and run safely and to encourage people to shop more locally? So perhaps, um, perhaps actually I'm going to pick on somebody. I'm going to ask Michael really what, um, you know, what, what you've been doing in Midsummer Norton. Um, as I know you've been doing quite a lot of work around this already. Um, I, I, as town council, do you mean? I, 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 I'm not aware of the town council um, engaging a lot with with business. I think, to be uh, to be honest, the government's furlough scheme has been the overwhelming uh, uh, plus, uh, which has which has which has kept businesses alive. Um, I'm intrigued to see uh, that Miss Norton High Street uh, does seem pretty vibrant at the weekend, but rather quiet at other times. I think Linda might, might have more information about that actually, as to how the uh, sort of um, stopping the lockdown is going slowly would be my suspicion. But uh, I, I think you've also had quite a lot of feedback, haven't you, from your local shops as well, uh, about you know, how that they've been working to ensure that uh, you know, your residents have been, you know, have received groceries, for example. Really, I, I wasn't aware of that actually. I don't know if Linda's uh, Linda is also a town okay. councillor. I don't know if she's heard. I'll that. move to, to Linda. Um, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know about the delivery of vegetables. Was that from supermarkets? I, I understood that um, they they have been doing a lot of work, uh, and I know that there've been uh, some quite positive reports from well, something from residents. Um, I, I feel slightly that I'm, I'm bringing you unexpected good news. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. It's lovely always to get unexpected good news. Um, no, I've, I've regularly gone down the high street and if there's been a shop open, I've gone in and had a chat. Um, and a couple of weeks ago when everybody did sort of open on the Saturday, um, I sort of went down. It was also um, market day. And that they were back again, which was brilliant. So it was really nice. Um, and generally speaking, the attitude of the shopkeepers is positive. Uh, so I really like that. Um, and I'm just hoping that if we can get the people to come and shop, it's my big thing. I really, really believe that people should come down the high street and see what there is. Don't go to the, you know, precincts, um, you know, 10, 15 miles away and do your shopping. Come and see what's in Midsummer Norton, Radstock, you know, the little shops up at Westfield even, and, and peas down and, you know, every little village has got the odd shop. Well, go and find out about it. Don't just presume that it won't supply what you want because you could be very nicely surprised. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm a big, big fan of the high streets and I do all my shopping there. And somebody asked me today how much I buy online and I cannot remember the last time I bought something online because I just don't do it. I really go to the shops on the high street and I can buy my clothes and my shoes and my food, you know, um, from those local shops. So that's good enough for me. Yeah, uh, and that's the sort of message that we need to make sure that everybody gets, isn't it? That you know, yes. your local shopping centre will have lots of things for um, that that you you know will want. And actually, don't assume because this is the other issue I think that people have expected that um, locally produced food, particularly, would be more expensive. And I think most have been really quite quite surprised that that's not necessarily been been the case. No, no, it's not. And I've been doing quite a bit of shopping for my neighbours in Welton. And um, I'm because we don't have a butcher's in Midsummer Norton, so I go to Radstock, to the butchers there. And they've been amazing. I ring them with an order and I give them a list of names and the names, you know, with what the customers want. And it's all made up in separate bags with the bills showing separately and everything. And they're fantastic. So I'm hoping that when this is over, those people will go and get their meat from, from that shop because that's what they're used to. 
Of course, it'd be lovely if he opened up in Midsummer Norton oh. as well as as well as Ransack. <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to push that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's down to you as a town councillor, isn't it? To encourage people to set up business. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Being realistic. We have to be realistic. But yeah, I think that's the sort of service that these local people give. So, yep, let's go with it. Everybody. Okay. All right. Well, I'm sure that, you know, I know the council's got some ideas about sort of support schemes that we could be putting out there for uh, local high streets, local shopping areas. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch, Linda. OK, right. We'll have to get um, Michael to get out there to, to do a bit of shopping as well. <laughs> Sally. It really just echoes what Linda just finished off with there is it in the villages of small shops have been absolutely brilliant. Um, one of the villages I am close to, uh, it's, it opened um, just well, practically days, I was going to say, nearly before lockdown. And when they were struggling because that particular village hasn't got a shop where to get things, you know, they've just cut trumps with you could ring orders in, you could, they were delivering, all those things. What we need to do now is to be sure that people stay supporting them because um, that is the biggest fear that people now will not stop supporting them. Um, in one way, you know, I think it's been a a bonus from some of the small shops, more so than probably they would initially expected. But uh, um, I am worried that um, as habits change and people go out more, some of those habits will that they've had in lockdown will perhaps change. So let's hope that they keep it going because certainly in the villages, the small shops have come up trumps with their deliveries and all the different things they've done for people. Mm. And and so you know, I, I would um, say again that the council can do some more to to help um, and you know I think we will definitely uh, come back to to you Sally as well um, with some uh, some some thoughts uh, you know and, and pick up conversations that are already going on and of course yes the um, uh, the Farnborough uh, shop the farm shop there is is a fantastic resource isn't it um, for you yes one of them but you go to High Littleton Apple Yards uh, uh, High Littleton they've opened up they've covered not only High Littleton they've covered um, Clutton as well where they don't have a shop um, and they had only opened up as I say a matter of days the people would have known it's what we would call Dando's if you live around this area and Dando's is a brilliant but it's just been taken over by now I think Spa actually but they have been absolutely brilliant but the Apple Yards are a local family so they know you know the, the people around and they have just yeah, come up trumps. I think all all the groups are, and even the shops that you couldn't open, like hairdressers and that. You would hear people saying that the hairdressers had wrong and kept in touch with their clients and stuff like that. I obviously, I appreciate it's in their own benefit as well, but it is just so nice, particularly those people who are all perhaps on their own and so on. That um, you know, that was just more outreach work that perhaps you know didn't go through the hubs and things like that that we didn't think about. But loads of people like that have kept in touch, and away the pubs. Um, became like takeaways or and work their way through the different things you know more of those um, went through I know in Princeton and you know all the villages around here I think had in the end a takeaway from their pubs before they could open up again. Yeah thank you actually for reminding me of that I had forgotten that so many pubs uh, did sort of tran transform into into a takeaway service and uh, and actually I think you're the first person who's mentioned hairdressers actually ringing up their their customers because i i suspect a lot of the reason why they have such loyal customers is because they can go there on a you know every every few weeks and they can have a nice sort of chat and it is really nice and 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 probably does a huge amount for um their their so their mental health as well hmm. So I think I need to pass on a thank you to, to hairdressers as well. So I'll put that to you, Sally. If you could thank all your local hairdressers for me, that would be fantastic. I'm certainly glad when I could get my hair cut. <laughs> it's looking lovely. <laughs> okay. Um, so before we just move just on to just hair, um, I'm just seeing if there's anybody else who's indicating that they want to, to speak on on this if anyone has got any other ideas around how we can be uh, doing more to help our local businesses you know and the obvious one is clearly just go and shop there just go and buy your things there uh, Michael well I just mentioned that the, some, the obviously the charities have been playing a role as well um, I, I, I do some volunteer driving for Swan and I know 
that's had to stop completely. Um, but Swan have been ringing the, 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 the passengers and keeping in touch and also with the drivers actually, therefore keeping the whole thing ticking over. So the charities mm. are playing a part as well. No, thank you. Yes, and I, you know, you're, you're, you're right. And there's this whole, it's like a sort of undercurrent of fantastic people that you don't necessarily always notice, but the benefit they bring to individuals is, is going to be immense. I'm not seeing any more hands. I'm just going to double check. I'm not missing anybody in the chat or in the, um, in the participants list. Right. So, so we have sort of touched on this a little bit more. We were talking about local outbreaks. Uh, the, the last question that I've got here um, is what can we do to respond quickly and decisively if there were localized outbreaks in specific neighborhoods or population groups? So it'd just be useful to hear, you know, what your thoughts are uh, about perhaps mobilizing support, mobilizing um, some sort of action uh, that, that would help with, with those local groups. And it might be, you know, disorganizing, uh, you know, a, a shopping to, to come in, or it may be some other um, ideas that you have. Uh, Sally? It's got to be whatever we want, make a decision and make it and stick to it and make it sure everybody knows what it is. We're not faffing around like, oh, do we need help? Don't we need help? So if we make a decision, we need to know exactly what it is, because now we know there's groups out there that will support it, and we need to go to those groups. Um, but we need to make that, and, and I think make the decision. It's better to make a decision when perhaps you're not, you think, well, shall we, shan't we? Make the decision, because you can always say, well, actually, we didn't need quite that much support. But I think, to me, um, make a clear decision, make sure everyone knows what the decision is, and, and we've got groups out there now that support it, um, and, and that we can pass that message across. And also, I guess the other bit that we need to do is when we make a decision is to make sure everybody knows where to get more information from. Um, because you're with the best one of the world, it, it would be very difficult to convene a meeting like this and then share that information with you yeah. and then keep on coming back to share more information. You yeah. need to know that that is all in one central point and whether that's on the website, whether that's through local radio, whether or not that's, you know, you know, there's got to be, and there will be a variety of different um, avenues where you will be able to, to pick up that information. But I think you're, you're absolutely right. You know, you make a decision, you make it. Yeah, and that message needs to go out, you know, all the different avenues at the same time. Not think, well, did I hear it on the radio? Or maybe, you know, and check the website and it's not on there. Wherever we put it, we need to get it through all the media at the same time. Yes. Bruce. And I think one point, we, we all talk about media, we talk about online. We have to remember those people who may not have much to do with any and so there's leafleting there's putting up leaflets in shops there's door dropping we have to you know there might be a few people we really have to go the extra mile and and there will be local people that probably know who they are and how to contact them so that's another place where your help will be uh, really useful mm. absolutely thank you for that bruce um so is there any other points people want to, to raise on, on this? Any other thoughts you've got about what more we can do? Um, any other avenues that we might not have um, considered? I know, because I know some have got a, a local uh, newspaper or magazine that goes out relatively regularly. So again, you know, putting information in there, not about necessarily an outbreak, but about make sure you're keeping you know you've got access to the, the radio station or you're you're in contact with the the parish clerk or somebody who will make sure you've got that information when you need it so if you're not on somebody's list it's almost like get on somebody's list uh, and obviously as, as i'm being reminded um yes the council does send out a weekly newsletter so if you've got people who are online who would like to receive it who don't currently receive it then let us know um i forget exactly how many uh readers we have but it's a 
quite a surprisingly high number. I'm going to quickly skim to Dave in case he knows offhand what the number is. I, I was afraid you were going to do that because off the top of my head, I don't, but I'm fairly certain that Sarah does. <laughs> that was a good way of passing the buck, wasn't it? <laughs> and I was afraid that Dave was going to do that to me also. And unfortunately, I don't know, uh, but I know it's in the thousands, if not tens. Um, I know the distribution is, is very wide, um, but obviously the more people sign up to it, the more they get the most up-to-date news. So do encourage people to sign up to it um, as much as possible. Yeah, I, I, I think actually the number, I should have answered it myself really. I think the number is something like 30 to 40,000. So it is, you know, a quite an, an amazingly high number. And obviously during the outbreak, that number has increased. Um, so, and I would assume that all your parish clerks and, uh, and everybody else already receives that. But if you know of one who isn't, then obviously use your best persuasion to make sure that they're they're getting that that information too um right so those were sort of uh the 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 questions that we wanted to discuss with you uh i i wondered actually if there's any other issues people want to to raise because i know we've got a little bit more time um if, if there's other things people want to to bring to our attention david david collett Um, you're obviously having problems with unmuting too. I'm there married, you are. I think. Well yeah. done. My problem is slightly different in that we spend a lot of time talking about the immediate recovery problems and the short term recovery problems. One of the reasons that I wanted to talk was that in the medium term, there are still a great deal of concern locally about the bus services that we fought for for the last two years. They realise that by next spring, it's all going to be very, very different. And there's a great deal of concern as to whether there really will be any local rural bus service at all, unless something dramatic happens. Um, all I hope to do today was put in a marker that, as far as the officers and you personally were concerned, to make sure that you are aware of the concern and doing what you can, both within Baines and within the west of England, to make sure that they are taking it as an immediate problem rather than pushing it into the long grass and leaving it to happen when it does. Absolutely. Yes. No, um, I, I have been. Um, I'm becoming a little bit of a bore on the subject, I think, um, in terms of when I'm talking about rural buses uh, and actually the, the necessity to keep the network running. And it obviously is going to be more challenging. Uh, well, it certainly has been more challenging when there were the, the social distancing rules were um, uh, the, the two metres distancing um, I'm, I'm not sure that one meter plus has made a huge amount of difference to the numbers that you can get on a bus um, but I know that uh, the bus companies have had some support um, from from government to keep them afloat um, I'm not sure you want a floating bus but you'll, you'll know what I mean um, and uh, you know and absolutely absolutely agree with you we need to make sure that um, rural bus services are fully recognised as the lifeline that they, they undoubtedly provide for villagers, for, for towns, uh, you know, for the people that um, need to go to places, but also the people that don't necessarily, you know, that might not be working somewhere, but actually use a bus, you know, to get to a social life. Um, you know, again, going back to young people, you know, I know that it is really hard for young people who, um, particularly in, in some of the you know villages and towns so they've not been able to go to school not seeing their, their friends yes okay they might be on xbox but it's not it's not nearly the same is it as actually meeting up um and i know that they have uh you know a, a huge reliance on on the bus services so that's a very long way of saying yes david thank you uh, but there is a real concern that there will be no bus company let alone no buses mm. <coughs> Yes, and I, I think we're all acutely aware of that. So that's why, you know, I think we're, we're grateful that governments have recognised uh, the dilemma that bus companies have been in and also that they have changed uh, a little bit their, their advice about using buses. Um, obviously, you know, that there's still a necessity to be safe 
if you're going to use a bus you know wearing the face masks uh not putting yourself in too close proximity to to others um i'm not sure is there any other issues about bus use bruce that i've i've, I've missed no i i think it's a really tough situation i mean all, all our push was for either active transport bicycles and walking or, or public transport to move away from endless use of cars and this has really um been a setback for that hasn't it and of course the need to know less than ever as, as david has uh, said and i think distancing i think you know being careful on buses gives means you can use them with the, the you know least risk but uh, certainly um it's not been a great um time for public transport has it and i, I think that the fears for the medium and term future are well founded aren't they hmm. yes so um is there any other comments anybody else wants to to raise anything they want anything they want me to to be doing in particular i usually leave these sorts of meetings with a big long list of jobs to do Well, how lovely. I only have one thing, which is to, to bother Wecker about buses. That's fantastic. OK, uh, what I'm going to do now, then, um, if there's no more discussion anybody wants to have around sort of recovery and, you know, our resilient communities and how we make, uh, you know, recovery more resilient, um, I'm going to actually hand back to uh, Linda. Um, because there may be some final things she wants to announce, you know, like future meetings, etc. Well, thanks very much, Dina. It's been, it has been, hasn't it, a fascinating meeting. And I'm really glad that we were able to do it. So thanks for all your help and Bruce, really appreciate it. And thank you for everyone else who's um, participated in the discussion. We um, obviously hope that you found it useful and as well as interesting. And if you've got any further thoughts or reflections, please do send them on to Sarah um, after the meeting. <laughs> I hope she's got some spare time. So we'd be pleased to hear from you also about future meetings. We have a provisional date planned for the next meeting on the 30th of September. You may feel we need to meet earlier, but please let us know by contacting Sarah with any suggestions about what you'd like to discuss. Uh, the council is also doing a series of webinars and I'm sure Dina would be interested to hear from you if you've got any suggestions for further topics um, there. So we really want to ensure that we keep, that we continue to keep up our engagement while all these problems are on. Um, and uh, well, Sarah has certainly worked very hard to build this up <laughs> and she's done it all for me fantastic and if there are ways in which we can do this without physically meeting um then let us know i just really hope that sometime in the not too distant future we can get back to having proper meetings again so again thank you for joining us and keep safe everyone night night good night <laughs>